Hey guys, what we got today is a question about golfing. And hey, I am on the very, very last page of your last notes packet. How excited are you? This is chapter 12, very last page. Um, keep in mind that there's a lot of times in, um, like on AP problems and on test problems that you've seen in the past, um, you're going to be given a lot of mini tab data and some graphs and histograms and such that... Um, which is just kind of nice because you don't have to compute those numbers yourself. Remember, we've been doing a lot of stuff with these mini tab regression outputs, and you need to know that this is your important info right here um, in order to write the equation of the LSRL. But um, you also know how to do scatter plots and histograms and stuff in your calculator. But the nice thing about this problem, again, is, and this is a lot of times what we see on the AP, is that they give you a lot of the data um, graphically as well. You just need to know how to take all this information, put it together to solve your problem. So here this question is about golfing. Um, what they've done is they've taken the opening drive, so the drive distance, the, the distance that you hit the ball off the tee, and the score per round. Um, and this is from 2008 PGA, and they took an SRS of 19 out of the 197 players in the 2008 PGA. And so what they're doing here is they're taking the mean distance on the x-axis, and they're comparing it with the mean score. And so why do we see a negative correlation here, or a very rough negative correlation? So keep in mind that in golf you want a lower score. That means you hit the ball less times, which means you are a better golfer. So that does make sense that the farther you drive, um, maybe the the better score you have. So that's what we're trying to analyze here. We've got our, our information for the LSRL here. We've got a histogram. We've got a scatter plot of the residuals. And again, here is our, our question we need to be answering. Do these data give convincing evidence? So that means we need a hoe and a ha, and we need to reject or fail to reject, um, that the slope of the regression line is negative. Okay, so it looks like the slope of the um, regression line is negative, but is it convincing enough? So here's what we're going to do. We are first going to define all of our stuff. So we always start by defining what's the x, what's the y in context in this problem. And you can kind of cheat and look up here. Our x is the mean distance in yards. Our y is the mean score in points. Um, we want to know what this beta is. And remember, the beta is the, um, the slope. And so that is going to be given up here. Remember, it's the coefficient for the average distance. Um, and we're also given it up here for the predicted mean score here. And remember that predicted that and indicates that we're using a Y hat. And so make sure you've got your Y hat here for your sample LSRL. Um, it is here. It's not always here as you can see, um, but we use these two numbers in order to write our LSRL. Um, you will get dinged if you don't have a Y hat here. It's not a Y because we don't um, know exactly what each Y is. Each Y does not fall perfectly on this line. These are Y hats, which are predicted Y values, not the actual Y values that are observed. So here I filled in all my stuff. Um, pretty self-explanatory. You just need to make sure that you define everything because keep in mind, in your work later, you're going to be using an X and a Y and a beta, and you need to have exactly in your work what each thing stands for. Um, and if I'm going to use an X in my equation, I need to know what that X represents. So remember what comes next. I need to write a ho and a ha, and then I need to say what kind of a test we're going to do um, and why. So remember what the ho is or the null hypothesis usually for these kinds of problems is that the beta equals zero. That means that the slope is zero. And that means that it's not positive or negative, therefore we don't have a like useful linear relationship. So that's pretty standard um, to have the beta equal zero for the null. Remember, it's always an equation for the null that's consistent with chapters that we've done in the past. Um, however, how do we figure out what the ha is in this case? Um, read the question really carefully. Do these data give convincing evidence that the slope is negative? And so that is why I have a less than zero here. And remember, that means we're going to be doing a one-sided. So um, if it wasn't negative or if it wasn't positive, that would mean we would have an alternate hypothesis where it's not equal to zero, and that would be a two-sided. And remember, that means you have to double your p-value, and that's one of the most common mistakes that people make. In this case, we don't have to worry about it. I like to give myself a note or a reminder whether it's one-sided or two-sided. In this case, one-sided because the way the question is worded, it's asking us, is it negative? Um, I'm also going to write out what kind of a test I'm going to do and why. And so here's what that sentence is going to look like. Um, you can pause the video, copy down if I'm going too fast, but 
Um, since we're testing a claim, remember this time we're not coming up with an interval that we are actually testing. The question is asking us, do we have convincing evidence? We are doing a test similar to chapters in the past. What are we testing about? Um, the slope, that's up here, is the slope positive or negative, whatever. Um, we're testing the claim about a slope of a regression line. And the key part here, sigma is unknown. Remember, what we need to have here is that if sigma is unknown, that's why we're using a t-test. Um, well, how do we know the sigma is unknown? Because we have an SRS of 19. There's only 19 dots up here. Out of the, remember, there are 197, I believe, golfers. Is that right? Yeah, 197 golfers. We only have a sample. Therefore, we do not have data on every single golfer. Therefore, we cannot understand what the population sigma itself is. We only have an SRS. So that's why we're using a t-test. What are we testing for? Beta. And you know what comes next. Now we got to go through our conditions. And remember the acronym L-I-N-E-R. I'm going to write those out. So the L stands for linear, independent, normal, equal variance, random, L-I-N-E-R. That's our acronym. Um, you're going to have to pause and copy all this stuff down because I know you've gone through it in class, but I'm going to go through exactly what needs to be written out so that whoever's grading your AP test knows exactly what you checked for and that you understand what each of those five conditions mean. Okay, I warned you, this is going to be a lot, but here we go. Let me run through these quickly. You can pause and copy this down, but remember for the linear um, condition check, you're checking two things. You're looking at the scatter plot itself which shows a negative, moderate, linear correlation. So that's what you're looking at up here. Um, it is pretty weak, um, which is why I use the word moderate. I could use moderate to weak. Um, but it is a negative correlation, um, somewhat linear. We're given that up here, and that's what we're looking for there. Um, the other thing you're looking for is the residual plot, which is this one. And remember what you're checking for is you're making sure that there's no obvious curve or pattern. It looks like we have a very consistent random scatter of dots um, without a, an obvious curve or pattern. So there's that. You're looking at those two things for the linear clause. For independence, remember you're checking that 10% rule, same as what we've been doing kind of all semester long. And then make sure that you also state that the individual observations, which is the golfers in this case, each of their opening drives, they're independent of each other. One guy's drive does not impact or affect another guy's drive. Um, the normal condition, what you're looking at in this case is the histogram. Um, this is what we're given, and you're going to be given different things on the AP exam. You just got to know, um, got to be able to use uh, whatever it is that you're given. In this case, we're given a histogram of the residuals. It does not have an obvious skew, and that's what you're looking for. I would refer to this as very roughly symmetric and somewhat bell-shaped, no obvious outliers. Um, it would be very obvious if there was something that you would need to say and mention and therefore proceed with caution or something. It should be very obvious. Here I would say this is fine to say that it is roughly symmetric and bell-shaped. Um, and remember, we're not given a normal probability plot. That's sometimes the other thing that you're given. Um, you want that normal probability plot to be roughly linear. Um, in this case, we weren't given that, so we just had to use the histogram. you got to be able to use whatever you're given. Uh, the equal variance clause. Again, you're looking at the residual plot. It shows a consistent random scatter throughout. That's this one again. You kind of use that two different times in your condition check for two different things. You're trying to make sure that your residuals aren't really small at the beginning and then get really big or vice versa. You don't want them to be really big and then get very small. That would indicate that your predictability is more or less accurate at certain spots on the LSRL and that's not what you want. Um, the last thing is the random clause, and again, that's the same as what we've been doing all semester. Don't just say random check. Say what it is that's random. We have an SRS of 19 golfers. And now finally, my friends, we are ready to do some math, come up with a p-value, and, and finish this thing off. Okay, so remember, you got to say what the DF is. It needs to be in your work somewhere. The calculator will ask you for the DF also. Um, we're taking the, the sample size minus 2. I like to remember that it's 2 um, because we're, um, we're using an x and a y variable here. So 19 minus 2, that's just how I remember it. We have two different variables that we're measuring. Um, remember to state the significance level, the alpha. We're using 0.05 since none is given. And again, this is pretty much the same formula that we've been using all semester. The statistic minus the parameter divided by standard deviation. It's just a little bit different here now that we're in linear regression. We're using the... Um, observed slope minus the the beta from the ho, I guess, from the null hypothesis, and then the standard error of the slope also. So I'm going to fill in those numbers now. 
So here are these numbers. Um, I want to point out just a couple things. Remember, this is the observed slope that we have written in our LSRL above. The zero is the beta that we're testing, where we're testing is the slope zero, or is it something different? Um, where did this number come from, you might be wondering. So let me just zoom out and show you where that number came from. Here is way up here. So remember, you're given that information also. Um, that is where I'm taking that number from. And then keep in mind you're also given kind of another way of cheating, I guess. Here's what the T is going to be when I do that calculation that I need to finish below. And then here's my p-value. So you need to actually show the work where those numbers come from, but it's very self-checking. Just keep in mind that this p-value is a two-sided p-value. And since we are doing a one-sided test, our p-value is going to be half of this number. So that's one thing to keep in mind but it is a little bit self-checking. So I'm gonna finish this thing off and then write our conclusion. So here we go, guys, to finish this thing off, um, I have the value of T, which is up in the table also, so you can kind of self-check. That's what you get when you type this stuff into your calculator. And remember, that's not our P value, that's actually the T. So that's like the X value that I mark and I shade to the left. Um, and I'm trying to come up with the area, that's gonna be my P value. So since it's one-sided, my p-value is 0.0725. Um, that is half of what the p-value is up in the table. Remember, the table always gives you the two-sided p-value. And then you got to write a conclusion. The p-value is 0.0725, which happens to be greater than the alpha. Therefore, we fail to reject the null. And what was the null again, since we're failing to reject it? The null was that the slope was zero. And so you need to kind of summarize what does that mean. That means we do not have evidence of a negative linear relationship. So we can't say that it's negative. We can't say that um, the farther the guy hits the ball on the opening drive, that means the better score he's going to have. And that kind of is mirrored up here when we look at our scatter plot again. Remember that this scatter plot, it looks really weak. It's really hard to say, is that really negative? It's a very weak relationship. So that makes sense to me in that we are failing to reject. Um, our original null. We do not have convincing evidence of a negative re linear relationship. And then just make sure you say what was the relationship we were testing. The negative linear relationship between drive distance and score. Thanks for watching you guys. That finishes chapter 12. You are done watching videos. You are done taking notes. Congratulations. It's almost the end of the year. Bring those questions to class tomorrow. I'll see you later. Have a good night.